So I think that would be more surprising to me. So I think I have to accept it at face value. You're listening to Asian News Weekly, a digest from the Asia Pacific region. The Umbrella Revolution continues in Hong Kong. Will Kim Jong-un make an appearance today as North Korea celebrates communism and the changing face of the China Seas? These stories and more on the October 10th edition of Asia News Weekly. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm your host, Steve Miller, and I'd like to thank you for listening and downloading this week's show. Our lead story, once again, is the continued protests in Hong Kong. In the week since our last podcast, a number of developments have come to light as the situation remains fluid. For full details, be sure to check out our daily podcast, The Asia Brief. Here are some of the highlights from the week's updates that have brought us to our current situation. Last weekend, some 200 demonstrators faced off against a much larger group of anti-protesters in Mong Kok after they started to dismantle barricades in an apparent backlash against the demonstrations. Several from the clashes were left bruised and bloodied following the encounter. Talks to end the demonstrations had been scheduled with Hong Kong officials before the altercations took place, but were called off once the violence started. Police arrested suspected members of triad criminal gangs, and that should have been the end of it. However, that only served to raise even more questions. Images on social media outlets like Twitter and Facebook allege that city officials actually hired the triad members to disrupt the protest, even offering up to 1,000 Hong Kong dollars to do so. One image also appears to indicate that a brawler was an out-of-uniform police officer. The government refutes any implications, and many in Hong Kong suspect Chief Executive Lung to have strong ties not only with Beijing, but with the triads. Lung gave the assembled crowds a warning that any and all necessary action would be taken to ensure that civil servants returning from the holiday weekend would be able to gain access to their offices Monday morning. It was a move that only served to bring about even more in support of the Occupy Central movement, both home and abroad. However, Saturday evening and into Sunday morning, additional altercations occurred between protesters and authorities. Reports even indicated the police used pepper spray and batons in those confrontations. Over the weekend, one face did emerge more in media, that of young Joshua Wong. He's the 17-year-old activist and co-founder of Scholarism, the student movement that campaigned against Beijing's plan to introduce, quote, national education in 2012. Many equated that plan to brainwashing, and scholarism's actions caused the plans to be ditched. So Wong is no stranger to standing up to the mainland. Those not closely following the events in Hong Kong might also find it surprising that Wong was already once detained during this movement. After being released, Wong wrote on his Facebook wall, After being detained for more than 46 hours, I walked from Admiralty to Causeway Bay. What I saw was what I expected but their progress was more than anyone could have imagined. My feelings are mixed. I'm happy, but also worried. What transpired the remainder of the week partly rested on his shoulders. As Monday morning rolled around, demonstrators outside the chief executive's office in Admiralty said they would leave the streets near the headquarters on their own, as requested by C.Y. Lung as a measure of goodwill. Some schools also reopened, but many more stayed closed a precautionary measure by the ministry to ensure all students' safety. As expected with the holiday weekend over, the number of protesters on the street dwindled. With students backing down to avoid what could have been a bloody encounter with riot police, some have wondered if the Umbrella Revolution was in decline. Analysts said dissent both from within the movement and externally could bode well for the government. Peter Chung of the University of Hong Kong said, quote, By not retreating now, the organizers fall into the dangerous scenario of allowing the authorities, whether the Hong Kong government or Beijing, to drum up popular support to justify future measures, including Article 23. That's the controversial national security law that the government attempted to pass in 2003, but withdrew because of public outcry. As the protests in Hong Kong entered its second week, 
Some analysts were increasingly criticizing Western powers, most notably the United States and the United Kingdom, for not being more active in their support of the protesters. But as Shannon Tiezi of The Diplomat pointed out, that's the wrong path to take. The situation in Hong Kong is an internal one, and one that Beijing had already accused the West of instigating. Taking up an observational role and supporting the rule of law has been, and continues to be, the wisest course of action. Throughout the world, the slow build to crescendo received lots of press. That necessarily wasn't the case in mainland China, where the details were censored. Networks like CNN and the BBC, as expected, were silenced when covering the events, and state media spin the story in their favor. Taking the control of information one step further, a mobile digital security firm discovered something that no one had seen before. A Chinese-authored spyware bug specifically designed and targeted to infect protesters' iPhones and iPads. When the hacktivist group Anonymous learned of this, they declared, quote, full-scale war on Hong Kong's government and anyone opposing Occupy Central. In a message from the group, if you continue to abuse, harass, or harm protesters, we will continue to deface and take every web-based asset of your government offline. That is not a threat. It is a promise. On Tuesday, we finally saw a downward tick in the situation. Both sides agreed to talks, and the large number of protesters that had been so visible abated. To facilitate discussions, both sides agreed to a series of principles to guide discussions. They were, there will be more than one dialogue, that they will be held on the basis of an equal relationship and mutual respect, and that the government will implement any consensus raised during those meetings. Quote, to be honest, I don't have confidence that we can succeed. But whether we succeed or not, I am giving my best. I also learn that we can speak out when it is needed, said Dixon Young, a customer relations officer. Throughout everything, the police have made it known that the use of force hasn't been taken off the table, even though progress was being made to move the Occupy Central and student groups off the street. The reason? A growing number of anti-demonstration protesters and, of course, the violence that previously erupted in Mong Kok. As of Thursday, the number of protesters in Hong Kong continued to thin as students returned to campuses for school exams. Many Hong Kongers are also opting to support the movement while returning to their normal lives. Formal discussions on the future of Hong Kong are slated to begin at 4 p.m. on Friday. Rita Fan is a delegate to China's rubber stamp parliament. She said, I don't see why the National People's Congress Standing Committee would change its decision. It was a nationwide decision, and the decision has to face the country's 1.3 billion people. A clear reference to the fear that Beijing has that democracy may spread to the mainland and erode its power. Joshua Wong said, I do not agree with it because I believe that we have not achieved good results. In fact, for political reform, what we want is to have a true universal suffrage, civil nominations, and Chief Executive Lung Chun Ying to resign. While many are still fighting the good fight, Lung has reiterated he will not resign, and many students are coming to the realization that while their voices have been heard, Beijing won't simply bow down to their demands. An 18-year-old student protester said, I'm actually not that optimistic, but I think we need to stand up as I see our freedom is becoming less. And if we don't speak up, I really think we don't have any other chance. As of the recording of this podcast, the situation remains calm. Where things go from here greatly depend on the results of the planned discussions. See why Lung refuses to step down. However, he does need to leave office. Not necessarily in defeat, because he needs to save face, but because he's widely unpopular aside from this particular issue. Without Lung, both sides could approach the discussions anew. Concerns that the PLA would use its deployed forces in Hong Kong or send more to quell the incident are still valid, but as Rand Corporation's Scott Harold pointed out in last week's podcast, it would be a difficult operation to carry out. Hong Kong is on the global stage and is not isolated like Tiananmen Square or Xinjiang. Using that kind of force, wouldn't be in the country's best economic interest. But my question for you is this. How do you see events unfolding in Hong Kong? Be sure to give your predictions and reasons in the comments, on Facebook, 
or Twitter. While the protests present one challenge for China internally, another presents itself in the South China Sea. Kim Jong-un was last seen in public more than a month ago. The reports surrounding his disappearance, well, they're odd. While state media first acknowledged he was feeling some discomfort, those reports quickly expanded to include claims of gout, double ankle surgery, and even a coup. According to Rand Corporation's Bruce Bennett, that doesn't appear to be the case. What is really going on? Fundamentally, we don't know. They have denied that information. Could there be a military coup going on? Um, could be. We wouldn't necessarily know until uh, things had better developed and somebody had taken control and was able to exercise that, and that doesn't seem to have happened. Then last weekend, for the closing of the 2014 Asian Games, three high-ranking members of North Korea's leadership met with South Korean officials in Seoul. The North Korean officials, Hwang pyong So, Che rong hae and Kim yong gong met with the South Korean Unification Minister, Seoul's National Security Advisor, and the Prime Minister. North and South Korea have agreed to resume high-level talks sometime in late October or early November. Quote, This was not a one-off discussion. We must work to hold regular inter-Korean talks and pave the way for a peaceful unification, said President Park Geun-hae. These meetings were the highest level talks between the two nations under her administration. Huang from North Korea is the director of the General Political Bureau of the Korean People's Army, and many consider him to be the number two man under Kim Jong-un. When asked about the missing Kim, his answer remained the same. Everything is fine, and there is no problem. Kim is in control. So why haven't we seen him? Does he have anything to gain by disappearing? Some analysts say it might be a diplomatic tactic by Pyongyang, aimed at dividing and weakening international pressure over its nuclear weapons program and human rights record, or some sort of domestic propaganda trick. Quote, There's no sign that something big is going on, an official said, adding that Kim Jong-un's absence from some high-level meetings was not necessarily out of the ordinary, as his predecessors, Father Kim Jong-il and Grandfather Kim Il-sung, always did not attend these. However, today, Friday, October 10th, marks the founding of North Korea's Communist Party, the Workers' Party of Korea. Joining me on mobile phone is Daniel Pinkston, senior analyst and Northeast Asia deputy project director for Crisis Group. The, the DPRK seems stable, but dictatorships are always vulnerable to some instability, particularly there's a transition or leadership change. And if, in fact, there are serious health problems for Kim Jong-un, and if for some reason he were not able to lead or if he has some terminal illness, something like that, then of course it would raise the possibility tremendously of the for instability. Last week, we had a rather quick visit by Huang and other top-level officials from the DPRK during the closing ceremonies of the Incheon Asian Games. Does that signal any kind of intent as to what the DPRK's directions or goals may be in the future? Yes, the visit was very interesting in that uh, it came as a, a surprise to almost everyone. And media reports say that the notice or the offer of the visit was delivered to the South Korean government one day before, and that they had a, a quick uh, national security meeting at the Blue House, and they decided to uh, accept the offer. So if that is the case, then I think it's indicative of the kind of bold, emphatic leadership style of Kim Jong-un. We've seen it in the, the past kind of, what I want to say, kind of flamboyant or emphatic kind of events like the, the trial and execution of his uncle, Chang Kung Taek, public performances, pictures of him riding on a submarine. Those types of events would be consistent with his leadership style. So that could be true. Or the alternative explanation is that, in fact, it were uh, planned in long in advance and that kept secret until it was announced only an hour before they were to arrive in Incheon, basically when they were boarding their, their aircraft in, uh, in North Korea. 
So if that's the case, then um, it would be very surprising because I, I, I can't imagine the South Korean government planning and executing such a, a, a visit without it being leaked to the press. So I think that would be more surprising to me. So I think I have to accept it at face value and think that it's probably a sudden offer that was accepted. But as far as the intentions, uh, we have to look at the, the visit and what purposes it serves. And there are different audiences for the visit, of course. There's the uh, domestic internal audience in North Korea, and that includes the general population plus the core ruling elite. And then there's a signal towards South Korea and then to the international community uh, more broadly, but in particular towards China. So the message is slightly different to those different audiences, but it serves each of those messages serve uh, North Korea's foreign policy and internal uh, domestic policy objectives. On the one hand, internally, it signals to North Koreans that Kim Jong-un is being uh, decisive and he is being bold in pushing the unification agenda. And being a champion of, of unification in North Korea serves your political purposes in terms of survival and uh, deflecting any uh, criticisms from potential challengers. So that's smart uh, internally for North Korea. Secondly, for the audience in South Korea, South Korea is quite divided on how to deal with the North. There are hardliners who believe that a very hawkish approach should be taken and that North Korea should be sanctioned and isolated. Uh, and that's the best way to change the behavior, which most people in the South are frankly quite dissatisfied with. Most people, almost everyone, both on the right and left, would like to see an improvement in human rights. They would like to see uh, denuclearizing North Korea. They would like to see a, a liberalization in the economic sector, uh, relaxation of social controls, those types of things. Uh, now, of course, they argue regarding the, the degree of liberalization and, and measures that the North should take, but nevertheless, they're strong agreement on that. But when it comes to encouraging North Korea to take those steps, there are very uh, deep divisions in South Korea. So as I said, the conservatives, the hawks think that pressure, isolation, sanctions are the best way to change North Korean behavior, while those on the left or the progressive side believe that engagement and some encouragement and positive incentives are the best way to change North Korean behavior. So that visit on October 4th, I think kind of emphasizes that uh, the differences between the right and the left and the south, and it will cause greater division. So it will energize those who, who argue that North Korea is reasonable, the leadership is rational, we can deal with them, look, they're pragmatic guys, taking a hawkish approach only antagonizes them and makes things worse. So it serves the, the purposes in the south. In internationally, the visit demonstrates to China and to others that North Korea is taking the initiative, making an effort to reconcile with the South. They're not being belligerent. They're being practical and reasonable. And therefore, the North hopes that they will garner support from China in particular and also undermine uh, the sanctions regime internationally. So they want to wear down the multilateral sanctions. And by doing these types of events, they hope that the rest of the world will see North Korea as, as regular guys and they're not hostile or belligerent and sanctions don't really work. So we should give them sanctions relief. And one last question. Friday, October 10th, is the anniversary of the founding of the Workers' Party of Korea. Does Kim need to make an appearance? Well, he, he should make an appearance. It's uh, an event that he should attend. But if he doesn't attend, it's not super critical for his leadership, in my view. What matters is the nature of his health problem. I think it's obvious he has a health problem. Uh, he has a problem with his leg, at least one of his legs. There are different rumors and people making different interpretations of his health problems. However, we can only speculate about that. But obviously, there's something wrong with his, his leg, and it's not helped by the rapid weight gain. He's gained quite a bit of weight. And then some of the uh, lifestyle issues such as smoking and drinking and the high stress of managing a dictatorship uh, does not help all of that. So, so we don't know whether the problem is a simple medical one that simply requires some corrective surgery, for example. Maybe he's having a knee replacement. Maybe he's having an artificial limb fitted. Maybe he's had to have part of his leg amputated, something like that. Maybe they're trying to save his leg, uh, avoid an amputation, for example. 
In that case, it would explain maybe a long absence, or it could be something more serious, something that uh, an indication of some systemic uh, disease that is maybe more life-threatening or potentially life-threatening. And in that case, it's very serious, but we have no way to know that. And uh, of course, only time will tell. If he doesn't appear on Friday, do you think that North Korea will release some kind of statement? His absence or mentioning why he's absent, I, I doubt it. Nick Hansen, an expert on imagery technology and an affiliate of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University, said, Two new buildings at the Sohei Satellite Launching Station could be a missile inspection facility for potential foreign buyers. The complex's purpose remains unclear. The larger building appears to be a conference facility or an auditorium, according to Hansen's recent analysis. Another hiccup in the relations between North and South Korea took place Tuesday of this week. A North Korean vessel passed over the northern limit line, the de facto maritime border, which the DPRK does not recognize. After a 10-minute exchange of fire, the North Korean vessel retreated. Events like these are common, and neither vessel attempted to inflict damage on the other. The true motives for Kim's disappearance, the subsequent olive branch extended by Huang, and the recent exchange around the northern limit line remain to be seen. As many suspect, it's probably the part of some grand scheme, with the endgame as yet to be determined. What do you think will happen next with North Korea? Will we see Kim today on the anniversary of the foundation of the Workers' Party of Korea? Be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. If you would like to know more about this or any of the stories mentioned in the podcast, take a look at the show notes over at asianewsweekly.net. Last week, the United States partially lifted a long-time ban on lethal weapon sales to Vietnam to help improve its maritime security. Many consider it a historic move that comes nearly 40 years after the end of the Vietnam War. Quote, the State Department has taken steps to allow for the future transfer of maritime security-related defense articles to Vietnam, said State Department spokeswoman Jen Psaki. Officials made it clear that the sales of any specific weapons would be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, rather than making it a blanket approval to sell arms. The primary focus is to help Vietnam patrol and defend itself in the South China Sea amid growing naval challenges from China. But said weapon sales could potentially include airborne systems as well as ships. While Senator John McCain welcomed the move, John Shifton of Human Rights Watch said it was too soon. Quote, they are still arresting people. The number of arrests and convictions has gone down from its peak in 2013, but the raw number of people going into the system is still larger than the number of people being released. Dr. Ian Storey, a senior fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies Singapore, said the decision was definitely hastened by the oil rig crisis. It underscores America's increasing concern about recent developments in the South China Sea, and in particular, how Chinese assertiveness is seen potentially to undermine U.S. interests in the area. Storey also noted that the decision may be symbolic, as Vietnam purchases many of its weapons from Russia for far less. Human Rights Watch weren't the only ones raising concern about the change in the U.S. policy. China made its displeasure known, stating it would cause trouble to its national security. Given the ruckus China stirred earlier this year by moving an oil rig into Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, coupled with other disputes around the Paracel and Spratly Islands, it's no surprise the U.S. made this move. The United States and other foreign powers aren't willing to move in and force China out, but are looking for means to empower ASEAN members to settle these disputes. And unlike the Philippines, they simply can't sail in and stay for extended periods of times on military bases in Vietnam. This is the best option to level the playing field after China forcefully routed Vietnam this past summer. China, for its part, is also upping its game in the South China Sea, necessitating such changes in U.S. policy. The People's Liberation Army held a flag-raising ceremony on nine islands and reefs in those disputed Paracel and Spratly Islands to celebrate the 65th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. They've also dispatched their most advanced guided missile destroyers to the area to participate in, quote, naval exercises. Although the message is really clear, we have the superior firepower. 
And speaking of the Philippines, while it has granted access to its military bases in Palawan to the United States, the nation has stopped all development work in the disputed area because of the impact such activity might have on an arbitration complaint that is filed against China in The Hague. China has refused to take part in that arbitration, and a ruling is expected sometime late next year, although China isn't bound by the resulting decision. Don't miss our other podcasts, The Asia Brief and Asia Now. The Asia Brief is released Monday through Thursday mornings and gives you a glimpse into the region's top stories. Asia Now is released every Wednesday and features stories and interviews from the Asia-Pacific region. This week, the competitive side of Korean education. I sit down and discuss the research behind the high test scores of East Asian schools and the implications for business and society. And now let's round out the podcast with a weekly brief. In Kuala Lumpur, at least 14 people were injured as an explosion detonated at the Sun Complex in Jalan Bukit Bintang at about 4.20 in the morning Thursday. Police said those injured are tourists visiting the area, and authorities believe the incident is related to underworld activities. South Korea's prosecutors indicted Wednesday a Japanese reporter from a conservative Tokyo newspaper without detention. Tatsuya Kato, head of the Seoul Bureau of Japan's Senkai Shimbu newspaper, was indicted on defamation charges, saying he's harmed President Park Geun-hye's reputation by raising questions about her whereabouts on the day of the Sewol ferry sinking. Kato cited a column carried by the chosen Ilbo that stated Park's whereabouts were unknown for about seven hours, a development that caused rumors saying that she met a man at an undisclosed location. Quote, The indictment was made on the grounds that the article, written based on false facts, allegedly defamed Park's reputation by indicating without any proof that the female president had improper relations with an unidentified man, said the prosecution. A local group filed the complaint, and after three rounds of questioning concluded that the conservative Japanese newspaper purposefully tried to undermine Pak's character and called the accusation groundless, stating the president was in the compound. We'll have more on this story next week on our Asia Now podcast. Thai police last week charged two Myanmar men with the murder and rape of David Miller and Hannah Withridge, whose battered bodies were found on Koh Tao September 15th. The two Myanmar nationals are charged with the murder of both tourists, the gang rape of Withridge, and theft, said Pracham Rantong, police chief of neighboring Koh Pangang Island. The charges carry the death penalty. Citing from the confessions of the suspects, Police said the men entered Thailand about two weeks before the double homicides illegally, working at the AC pub. They hardly left the pub, as they had limited knowledge of the Thai language. The two told police that they had raped the woman and killed her, stealing her mobile phone and other belongings. They continued to work at the pub, since the police prevented all workers from leaving. Commentators on social media have accused the police of falsely implicating the two men saying they're merely scapegoats. Malaysia will join the U.S.-based Federal Bureau of Investigation in the fight against the Islamic State. Home Minister Dr. Ahmad Zahid Hamidi says, The ministry and FBI will combat this menace together. This will be a continuous cooperation on both sides that has been forged since 1975. We face a daunting task in combating extremism, especially when such ideas are spread widely through social media. In the same vein, Australian fighter jets have flown their first armed combat missions in Iraq against the Islamic State group, but did not launch airstrikes. Quote, the Super Hornet aircraft conducted an air interdiction and close air support mission over northern Iraq overnight. The Super Hornets were on call to attack targets as identified. On this occasion, the aircraft did not use their munitions and have returned to base to disarm and prepare for future sorties, said the Australian Defense Force. Canberra is also deploying 200 soldiers to Iraq, including special forces, to advise Iraqi and Kurdish troops, but has yet to receive final approval from the Iraqi government. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott has spoken strongly against the Islamic State, saying the decision to support international operation is in Australia's national interest. 
The World Health Organization and the United States National Institutes of Health have offered to assist Thailand in vetting a breakthrough in the search for a treatment for the Ebola virus made by Thai scientists. Thai research scientists at Mahido University's Siri Raj Hospital claim to have developed the world's first antibody treatment for Ebola, even without having access to the virus. The research team says they created a new kind of antibody using human genes so small that it can enter the Ebola virus, disrupting its ability to replicate. Experimental treatment is way off, but if the results can be replicated, it could prove vital to combating the current Ebola threat. Tokyo police are investigating the possibility that a Japanese student tried to travel to Syria to join the Islamic State. According to the Asahi Shimbun, police are questioning a 26-year-old man from Hokkaido University. The United Nations Security Council last month demanded that all states make it a serious criminal offense for their citizens to travel abroad to fight with militant groups or to recruit and fund others to do so, a move sparked by the rise of the Islamic State. Former Japanese Air Force Chief Toshiro Tamogami last month quoted a senior Israeli government official saying that as many as nine Japanese nationals have joined the Islamic State. Analysts also estimate that about 1,000 Asians have joined ISIS. Lee Jun Suk, captain of the ill-fated Sewol Ferry in South Korea, admitted during his court trial that he knew a junior member was at the helm at the time of the deadly accident. The Sewol, which was overloaded and top-heavy following an illegal refit, sank in April, killing over 300 passengers, most of whom were high school students. Asked where he was when the ferry ran into trouble, E said he was in his cabin, smoking and changing clothes. He denied the allegation that he had been playing computer games on his phone. When asked if he should have taken the helm as a ship entered channels notorious for strong underwater currents, he replied, Yes, I guess so. The 2014 Physics Award went to Isumu Akasaki and Hiroshi Amano of Japan and Shuji Nakamura of the University of California, Santa Barbara for the invention of efficient blue light-emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy-saving white light sources. Other scientists had previously produced red and green diodes, but without the blue diodes, white light could not be produced, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences said during its prize citation. Their work has spurred the creation of a whole new industry. The committee that chose the winners said that light-emitting diodes, or LEDs, would be the lighting source for the 21st century, just as incandescent bulbs had illuminated the 20th. Typhoon Vongfeng is set to hit Japan this weekend. It's a massive storm, expected to be as strong as Typhoon Haiyan, that devastated the Philippines, killing 8,000 and bringing with it winds of 300 kilometers per hour. It's the third major storm to hit Japan in recent months, once more bringing the threat of heavy rains and even more alarmingly, mudslides. China's Yunnan province was rocked by a strong 6.0 magnitude earthquake late Tuesday. At least one person has perished and over 300 have been injured. China's Xinhua News Agency also says that some 56,000 people have been displaced from their homes. And finally, U.S. and Japanese officials have laid out guidelines for expanding military cooperation between the two nations, responding to the modern threat environment. While the report doesn't mention any specific threats, the intention is clear. Monitor and plan for any possible altercations with China as it continues to assert itself in the East China Sea. The report also includes the addition of cyber attacks and threats to Japanese interests on a global scale. Those are all the stories for this week's podcast, but before I go, let's take a quick moment to hear from you. First up, Davey So says the 2014 Asian Games have definitely been the worst. He went on to list only a small number of the controversies that cropped up during the event, and each one of them was valid. Now, I'm not sure if this makes them the worst Asian Games, but it really does make one wonder what their legacy will be and how South Korea will approach the 2018 Winter Olympics. YouTuber The Olden Youth shared some thoughts about his experience living in Hong Kong. When I lived and grew up in Hong Kong, I enjoyed the multicultural communities that were prevalent at that time. Majority of them were South Asians. 
I lived in mainland China during the weekdays and every weekends or holidays in Hong Kong. I went back to Hong Kong in 2012 to renew my Hong Kong resident card. When I visited my old home in Chimsha Tsui, I felt saddened. The society and environment changed drastically. The air got more polluted while I witnessed frequent ruckus caused by mainland Chinese tourists and illegal immigrants. The standard Hong Kong atmosphere got too alien for me. Didn't felt at home except for one, the South Asian community. Now when I lived in Hong Kong a long time ago, the South Asian community was viewed with much suspicion. They were known for drug dealing and smuggling. That all changed over the years as education and immigration systems got refined making South Asians a positive part of Hong Kong society. In 2012, the South Asian community improved and became focal centers for commerce and technology. While my formerly favorite Hong Kong restaurants and hotels were replaced by new and disappointingly bland establishments catered primarily for mainland Chinese tourists, it was the remaining South Asian community that still contained the old spirit of Hong Kong's vibrant multicultural scenery. It's good to see that Hong Kong is protesting not only against the Chinese Communist Party, but also for preserving the rights of the many kinds of ethnic groups that call Hong Kong home. Hong Kong may not be my home anymore. But I don't want the diverse communities there to be ruined by Beijing rule. In addition to that, South Asians there are an integral part of the island as they connect Hong Kong with the rest of South Asia, Central Asia and the Middle East. Which means an abundant flow of commerce, legal businesses and rich investors between Hong Kong and those regions. India and Dubai especially. It is Hong Kong's own Cantonese culture and atmosphere that makes it an attractive site to many foreigners, more so than communist Chinas. May these protests succeed. Those were great comments, and I really do appreciate the audio comment this week. And everyone who left comments last time, thank you so much. I truly do value them. And I hope you'll take a moment to share your thoughts about the stories this week in the comments, or on Facebook, or Twitter, or recording that audio message and sending it to me. If you haven't found us on social media, the addresses are simple. On Facebook, just go to facebook.com slash Asian News Weekly, or you can tweet to us at Asian News Weekly on Twitter. You can also send an email to the show with questions or feedback, you know, what you like and what you don't. Just drop a line to podcast at asiannewsweekly.net. You can play and download all of our episodes on our website, asiannewsweekly.net. But if you prefer the show in podcast form, look for us on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and subscribe to the podcast. That way, you won't miss the next one. Well, my friends, it's time for me to go. I'd like to thank you so much for listening. And until next time, for Asian News Weekly, I'm Steve Miller. Asian News Weekly is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License.